So in the old days, uh, we had Robert Bly and James Hillman and other speakers come in and, and uh, share some thoughts and ideas. And we often used to joke that uh, the conference was often about whatever Robert was working on in analysis or, or what he read yeah. is, is what, what we would get. So, yeah. so, so, so uh, th this time around, Tim and I are, are going to try to follow a little bit in those in those footsteps and walk down that trail. And so today is uh, this morning is Tim's turn, yeah. and uh, he's written a, a, a little little booklet, a little S essay piece, and he's going to uh, share some of the ideas from that on the spiral and handout that you take away. Yeah. So uh, a few years ago, Walt and I were both reading the same book called The Memory Code. Uh, by Lynn, Lynn Kelly. She's an anthropologist, archaeologist from Australia, and she was talking about the Stonehenge circles and uh, all that, the, the stone circles in, uh, in the British Isles. And I was thinking about the medicine circles that we have here, the medicine wheels, and uh, I thought, well, that's there's got to be some correlation here. Different indigenous people. My people were from Ireland. Uh, you know, if what Lynn Kelly is saying, those stone circles were not merely for astronomical scientific investigation and keeping track of where the sun. They were mnemonic devices to help teach for personal development. Mm -hmm. So the hinge, which is the ditch, around at every stone, they would have a, a little gathering, and that stone became a mnemonic device for develop for the development of the individual. And how, wherever you were in the cycle of development, you moved to the next stone. So, and I'm thinking, oh, the medicine wheel's got to be the same. I mean, I've been up to, I've been up to the medicine wheel in the Bighorns 30 years ago, and it's all fenced off, and the prioritizers are there and everything. Uh, and I was lucky because I was there on uh, summer solstice, and I walked through the knee-deep snow to get there up at the top of the mountains, and there were a group of people there, and I got up there, and I'm standing looking over the the stones, and I get angry because there's a band of clouds on the horizon, so I'm not going to see the sun come up, come up and align with the, the, the proper stone. Uh, and my wife and my son were <coughs> going to meet me up there, and as soon as they got there, the clouds, the sun popped over the, the bank of clouds right when my wife and son came up to me and it aligned right with the, the proper stone. So I felt extremely blessed. And uh, in those days, I, I was just starting to feel the power of synchronicity and purpose. So that affected me. And I'm thinking about all these Irish stone circles. And I, I visited a number when I was in uh, in England and Wales, the Stonehenge, Aidsbury, which is even bigger, half a mile diameter, that stone circle. Then Walton was up in the Orkneys, there was a stone circle there, and I was small stone, stone circle in Gethwe, Wales, and uh, in Devon. Uh, and I thought, these things all have a connection. And I was reading a book by Fred Manfred, who was about 15 years older than Robert Bly, lived down in south southwestern Minnesota. His daughter, Freya, is uh, a little bit older than myself, and she's a poet and a friend of mine. Uh, and in one of Fred's books, he was a novelist, but he, his novels are more poetic than most novels. But I found this. Uh, and I use it as an epigraph for the essay. It was from all these that you were formed, 
and as to all these you must return. Life is a circle. The power of the world works always in circles. All things try to be round. Life is all one. It begins in one place, it flows for a time, it returns to one place. The earth is all that lasts. I've taken the circles, I've taken the circles, and we've talked here before about how, you know, those of us from the European uh, side of the world, you know, our, our minds are taught to be in a line. We may not live in a line, but that's what we're taught. Uh, our indigenous brothers are taught to live in a circle. That's why we have the medicine wheel. And as I was thinking about all these things, of course, in the, in the pre-literate Europe, they had the stone circles. Walton has a great book about when that occurred. Uh, with the Gilgamesh story when suddenly we stopped living with the oral culture and the circle culture you know and we got disconnected from that and we started paying attention to all the scientific uh, explanations for everything everything coming out of the intellect but we forgot things. And Miguel's been talking this, about this for a long time. We have to have relationship. Life is a relationship. What did, I, what, what did we witness here? We witnessed something physical. What's it related to? Did you see gravity? It's invisible, right? <laughs> the relationship between the physical and the invisible, you know? So one of the other things that I've been studying for a while is cave art. What is one of probably the most ubiquitous uh, piece of cave art? Let's go. It's the hand, right? All over, all over. I found a poem by Robinson Jeffers that I want to read about that. It's a, I mean, it's just a, it explains it all for me, but it's much deeper than that. Where are you, Mr. Jeffers, here? And this is, the title of the poem is simply Hands. Inside a cave in a narrow canyon near Tassajara, the vault of rock is painted with hands. And I'm sure you've seen this all over, it, 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 it's all over the social media. <laughs> The vault of rock is painted with hands, a multitude of hands in the twilight, a cloud of men's palms, no more, no other picture. There's no one to say whether the brown, shy, quiet people who are dead intended religion or magic or made their tracings in the idleness of art. But over the division of years, these careful signs, manual, are now like a sealed message saying, look, we also were human. We had hands, not paws. All hail you people with the cleverer hands, our supplanters in the beautiful country. Enjoy her a season, her beauty, and come down and be supplanted, for you are also human. Those people way back there. So what did they, what did they use the hand, the human hand? 
couple years ago, I was watching a video, and I had been following this uh, Navajo man who does these Navajo tradition YouTubes, and this one little 10 minute video, he, <laughs> he says, you know, in our tradition, the Navajo tradition, the five fingers represent the five senses. Taste, hearing, smelling, touching, seeing. He said, but you look at the hand. What represents the spaces between the four spaces? He says, there are four invisible senses. And I can't talk about that here. I have to go into the Hogan or into a teaching place. And I thought, it just blew me away when he said that. Because as a poet, that's one of the most important things is to pay attention to what is not there. You look at the trees, look at the spaces between the leaves, not just at the leaves. In music, the sound of the rhythm is a combination of sound and silence. It's what's not there. It's the rhythms that differ. And we all have different rhythms. Each one of us is, has different things happening. <laughs> so, I'm gonna, I, I took that as a challenge from Mr. Wally Brown, the Navajo elder. And I thought, okay, I'm 70 years old. I've had a fairly rich life experience. I've, I've read, I've studied, I have personal experience. How would I define the invisible senses? And this, these are, this is my explanation of my experience. You may have different labels, different ways of explaining it, but this is what I came up with. There are four in, invisible senses. And the first invisible sense is simply awareness. Simply awareness. I've been reading a student of P.D. Ospensky, Hugh Brock, Brockwell Ripman, in one of his books, he, he calls that awareness the silent witness. The silent witness. Babies have that. They come into the world with their silent witness. <clears throat> the second invisible sense is I call drive. There is something innate in us that pushes us forward. There's something that wants us to keep moving in life. It is life. That drive. The third, and I use this because of uh, raising my kids. Little kids, you know, they want to move. They want to move. They want to crawl. And once they crawl, they want to drop, they want to walk. There's something pushing them inside. But, you know, when that first time when they, they start walking and you're holding their fingers, their chubby little legs are moving, what do they want? what's the thing that they strive for? Balance. And balance is the third invisible uh, sense. Awareness moves to drive. Drive then moves toward this sense of balance. But what does a baby or a little kid do after they've made those first steps? They go up to the hassock or they come to daddy or mom and they beam. They have this sense of awe. Look at this. Look what happens. 
when you get balanced, everything is awesome. And you can feel it in their face when they look at you. That sense of awe is the fourth invisible sense. Awe is, what, what did we call it? Uh, an aesthetic arrest, which is a complicated <laughs> word for awe. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's like the inhalation <gasps> mm. <sighs> the exhalation is reverence <sighs> awe and reverence are the same two, two sides of the same coin so and once you have that sense of awe and reverence you've gone around the circle so let's say awareness is connected with the rising sun. All of a sudden there's light. I'm aware of the light. You move around a little further. As you become more aware, there's more light. And then dry is connected with the sun, the heat. The sun is working on, on all of this stuff inside of us. The flesh and the awareness, it's, it's, it's heating things up. And heat and drive and awareness leads to curiosity, maybe ambition. And so many young people get so caught in there, in that. The drive, the drive, the drive. And if you don't move toward a sense of balance, if you don't follow that, in, that innate sense of balance, you get stuck. And so many of our peers got stuck in the heat of the drive. It's an addiction, you know? And what is, what is the, the work of Bill W. It's arriving at balance. It's a way of counteracting that addiction. Got to come back to balance. The third sign, the third sign, the setting sun. The setting sun, as the sun goes down, you're starting to get to, once again, evening, night, daytime. And when you have a sense of balance, and you're starting to see the sun go down in the west, we have a prim primeval fear in us. It goes way, way back. But as the sun sets and you're still, you're still there, you're still feeling your sense of balance, and you watch the, the sun go down, all of a sudden, this miracle of stars occurs above you. The Milky Way, the moon, the changing patterns. It's like, oh my God, how much beauty. And of course in the darkness, your, sense, your, other, your physical senses are in some ways diminished. Especially for, for us <coughs> in the West and out of European traditions, it's our eyes. You know, 90% of, of what we take in comes through our eyes. And then they lose that. And suddenly you have reverence. And when you have reverence, there's a desire to worship. There's a desire to express gratitude. And this is not worship for give me more. This is like, wow. This is a miraculous, wonderful place to be right now. It's beautiful. And as you start feeling that, that prime, primeval fear dissipates. But the sun comes up, so now you have new awareness coming through. The dream that we had last night, suddenly it comes in in the morning, it's like, oh, what was that dream? 
and you start figuring it out. The dream brings some more uh, awareness, some more information. It starts us in the cycle again. And we start going, and every time we grow, or every time we go around the circle, and the circle is based upon the turning of the earth. This is one of the basic things that our, our kids are not taught to pay attention to. How many, how many children know which direction is east and west? Where's the sun come up? Where's the sun go down? Have you been able to see the stars? Our education system, system is eliminating that. What we need is we need to take the little two-year-old out and say, oh, here comes the sun. Look how pretty that is. You feel the warmth coming, and at night, take it out, watch the sunset. Look at the beautiful red clouds. And the more we teach our children those kind of things, and take them out at night, show them the moon, the stars, you give them that sense of awe and education. My wife works in inner city school with pre-K kids. They have an incredible amount of knowledge. I mean, uh, energy. And not a lot of knowledge. Because for whatever reason, they're dumped off at school. We got three-year-olds in the school. Get on the bus at 8.30 in the morning three and four year olds, they get off the bus at quarter to five in the evening. My wife in, the, in, in her classroom, there's possibly, sometimes there's two TAs, my wife's a TA, the teacher, three adults for 18 kids. You know, something's gotta change there. But I'm digressing, that's my, my rant right now, I gotta get back on this. Uh, <laughs> 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 Got to come back to the family fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so as as we follow the invisible senses, and they connect with the physical senses, you know, we develop. I, one of the things I love about poetry is poetry is there at the nexus between the physical and the invisible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the best poets connect both of them in, with great beauty and great feeling. Mm -hmm. If we continue the cycle, every day we learn something new, every day we go around the circle, in our, let's say, the, uh, the greedy capitalist system, they go from, from awareness to drive, then they go to balance, and they go right back across to the, to the start. They, they forget reverence. They forget awe. They ignore all the beauty. They ignore the art in our political systems, <laughs> in our monetary systems. They miss that. Just in the same way the addict gets stuck in the south and wants to bypass balance and go right into worship and awe and reverence where you're expanding or contracting. But the sense of balance is like, I mean, how many rock stars do we know that died of drug overdose before they're 30? Because they got they got so I, this is so fantastic, you know. And so they were using using something to calm, to quiet down, and then you know, going, bypassing the sense of balance. So we have to continue the circle. We have to follow this particular pattern of development for our inner being in the same way that we follow patterns for our outer being. Uh, 
in this in this little booklet, I uh, I, I introduce how I came about this. Uh, I'm not going to go through that. I I want to talk a little bit about the continuing the circle and how all of this is connected with what we talked about. And Miguel has repeated this over and over every time we meet. You know, we live and work and exist in circles. What did he, what we did we do before we came across the gateway? Miguel is going around in a circle. That's what we do all the time, every day. <coughs> Honoring through the circulation, all of these different directions. You can go online and there are other uh, teachings about the medicine circle from different people and it's all valid information. I'm just speaking from my personal experience. This is what's coming from me. And it does not, I don't think it contradicts what others are saying in their way. And they're not contradicting me. It's just a different language. It's a different tr translation of what we experience. And that's another thing I found through poetry. Poetry led me to all this. Mm. It's in the translation of things that, you know, my translation is truer than his. Huh? You know, <laughs> my word is, is, is more accurate than yours. So, uh, I want to I want to get rid of that that sense. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you have, it's it's like a personal religion. If you have a personal way of connecting to the source, religio, linking back. You know, I honor that because that's your experience. So, uh, after I came worked with these four invisible uh, senses, I decided to ask my wife, I said, I, working with children, what do you think children need? What are their basic needs that they should learn? And it was like an instant response. Boundaries, manners, morals, and prayer. So, I, it, it all of a sudden, bang, it fell right on top of that circle, on top of those directions. Awareness, boundary. What does a child learn? At the very beginning, it's the mother, me. That, but there's a boundary between us. Father, son. That simple boundary. How do you navigate boundaries? With manners. Manners don't mean you care for that other person, but you navigate with, a, with, uh, with manners. Manners are in the South, it's with the heat. Uh, I used to work at the Red Ring Correctional Facility, and one of the most common things that we had to teach kids when they first came in is to say, Please. Thank you. Thank you. That simple thing of respect and acknowledging the boundary. And they'd say, well, what do I need that for? You know? <laughs> it's like, yes. you know, <laughs> manners are like the lubricant, like the oil in your car engine. You know? They make things go a little smoother. And like a car engine, if you don't have manners, things get hot. Friction builds. And pretty soon everything seizes up. First gateway to violence. Yeah. But manners, they lubricate that. So we had to teach them manners. One of the classes that I taught was called Moral Judgment. 
and it was developed by some some fellows in Ohio, at Ohio State, and I won't get into this, the specifics, but they said there are four levels of moral development, and this is what the uh, our curriculum was focused on these four levels. And so when a when a student came in, the caseworker would identify where he was in this circle of morals development. And the first one was might makes right. Mm -hmm. The first level of moral development, might makes right. I'm stronger than you, I can tell you what to do. I have more power than you, I can tell you what to do. Should run for president. Yep, that's the first level of moral development. And these guys that come in and say, well, you got all the power. Yeah, we, you know, in an institution we had the power, but we're here to help you increase your power. The power differential doesn't have to manage that way. We're going we're gonna to work with you so you can make it easier in your life. And the second level, and we, because we had classrooms, cottages, where they, we had guys at every level, we'd say, okay, watch these guys. So the second level of moral development was scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Let's make a deal. That's like manners, right? I'll give you this if you give me that. That's right. It's transactional. You know? And it's like, just watch that guy, you know? And if you say please off enough, if you follow these manners, you don't have to give a shit about me at all. But you're going to get more benefits. You're going to get more out of this thing instead of keeping your mouth shut and saying fuck you all the time. Mm -hmm. And the sociopaths, they understood that right away. <laughs> the sociopaths are some of the best ones with manners. So then there's the third develop, the third level, and that's morals, Eric. That's a moral development, and it's like, do unto others as you would hope they do unto you. It's no longer transactional. It's about this sense of hope, this sense of, okay, I'm going to do this for the benefit of myself and, and you, and hopefully, you know, it'll make it easier on all of us. It's easier to live together because you've lowered your expectation of other people. Which is, in my mind, is one of the, the problems with all of our religions. High expectations. Let's just lower those expectations. But act with hope. Treat others as you would hope they treated you. Again, do you, do you feel the balance? Because suddenly you're caring about that other person. Unlike manners where you don't care, it's just all transactional, functional. Suddenly you have this moral development and you're finding balance between yourself and the others around you. You see how this is fitting the circle? How it's fitting the four directions? So the fourth the fourth level of more development that we worked with, uh, they called it giving back. I'll just call it service. That's giving yourself, that, giving your life for the people around you. And, at the, and, and in those ways, you have, we, we use all sorts of different examples. You know, the, the easiest, quickest one was Jesus. Right? Or Martin Luther King Jr. They, people that gave their lives. And then I'd say, well, how about that 14 year old boy that has to stay home, take care of his sick grandmother, and his three year old little sister 
has to stay home and can't do all those things. He's giving his life for that family. <clears throat> that small area. He's serving his, his family, his grandmother, his child. He's giving up his friendship, maybe hoping someday he'll be able to do that, uh, reconnect with the others. But that's service. So we've gone around the circle again because service is when you bring all this awe in. You're aware of the bigness of things and the smallness of things. And you're reverent in your prayer. Now, not every 14-year-old that's staying home has that, but I have met a couple. So we go keep going around the circle. Well, what's happening? This isn't just a circle on the ground going around and around and around. This is going upwards. It's that coil. Remember I mentioned the coil? The energy coil that goes around and around creates more and more magnetism. The more power that goes through that. And what is a coil? It's a spiral. You know, there's a direction. It's going this way. It's going downwards. Biology is filled with spirals. Thomas Smith, who was here yesterday, had a, had a poem about spirals. I'm not going to be able to find it this quickly. I live my life in growing orchids. That's another one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Real good. That's another one, real good. Right. It's the spiral. The Milky Way, the spiral. If we were able to go out far enough, we could see that the Earth's orbit is a spiral. Mm. You know, we're taking this on faith. What we do know is that the Earth turns. We do know that the Sun and the Moon turn. There are all these different uh, spirals occurring, all these different coils. The universe is, uh, functions with the spiral as far as we can tell. So we've got these four things, uh, inner development, we've got the invisible senses. Uh, there's also the, uh, let's see, what, what was the other? I'm getting caught up in my own. Uh, yeah. yeah. So then, last spring we did a, a poetry conference here and I talked about, uh, in 1990, Robert Bly, he was working on this and he brought, he came to our little short conference that year and he said, yeah, I've been working on this. There, There's four, four types of thinking that I'm working with. The first one is concrete thinking. You know, facts only. When I worked at the, uh, at the correctional facility, our incident reports had to be facts only. No opinion, no emotion, facts only. The best journalists do that. They should do it. The best uh, law enforcement people are supposed to do it facts only. You know, it's concrete, concrete thinking. And Robert used a, a poem by uh, Michael Dennis Brown, who was my professor, about watching a lamb being born. It's in Rag and Bone Shop. And there's almost no emotion uh, expressed. It's just reporting what's happening. But towards the end of the poem, he mentions that Mimi is watching and Mimi's pregnant. And he's there with his older mother. And so you have this sense of time, this sense of movement. And he he, then he reports how the herd of ewes are coming to watch the ewe and the newborn lamb. And so you're starting to get this wider sense of community. And there's a movement. So then Robert used a, a poem by Sharon Olds as the second type of thinking, which he called 
emotional or psychological thinking. And he has a poem. It, for poetry, he used Sharon Old's poem. Uh, it's it's Saturn uh, about the, the father taking over the house with his emotions, oh, yeah. eating his children, and his eating while swallowing, swallowing their emotions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but since we are, you know, it's a men's conference of poetry. I used an Alden Nolan poem about Alden Nolan. Uh, struggling with his son. So. Pardon? Only when my heart freezes. Mm. That's it. Yeah. Mm. Only when my heart freezes. Where I want to read that because Alton Hall is one of my favorites also. Only when my heart freezes. Do I cover the power to hurt the enemy as you and I can hurt each other, my son? With a thoughtless word, a careless glance, an unexpected departure. You crush your tears with your fists. Every door in the house bangs shut. And I too am afflicted like the refugee orphan who leaves a full table with bread crusts to hide in her pillow. We understand why Johnson gave that terrible shout when Boswell left him without a word and galloped ahead to search out an inn, a famous literary event. Quote, if you had not come back, I had never spoken to you again. That's what Johnson said to Boswell when he came back. The pair of them, half mad like you and me, and night falling in a strange and wild country. You can, that poem just is loaded with all of that emotion. And the, the way he uses his language. Poetry has brought me to these places. I write as a poet, in this, not as a scientist, not as a theologian. This is from my experience as a poet. And I use poet, po poems as examples. So we're talking about the emotional, the, the emotional, uh, in the south, the heat, the heat that comes within families, the emotional way of thinking, and so many of us get stuck right there. The next, the next level of thinking that Robert brought was metaphorical thinking. And, Scott, we were talking about that yesterday. <clears throat> Metaphorical or mythological thinking. And we use mythology to help explain some of those things, bring balance into this, into our, our beings, to explain those things that our day-to-day -day language cannot explain. We use mythology. You know, that's what archetypes are all about. It's a mythological explanation. You know? And ma many times in these groups, we get stuck there, right there, with mythological language. There are people that come into these circles and they say, well, you guys have your own language. I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. You know? Because we have to understand the metaphors, and we may not. Uh, and I used a Gary... Gary Snyder poem as the example of this one. Here's a, uh, this is one of Gary Snyder's poems called Old Woman Speaks, or no, Old Woman Nature. Old Woman Nature naturally has a bag of bones 
tucked away somewhere. A whole room full of bones. A scattering of hair and cartilage. Bits in the woods. A fox scat with hair and a tooth in it. A shell mound. A bone flake, or a bone flake in a stream bank. A purring cat crunch, crunching the mouse head first, eating down toward the tail. <coughs> the sweet old woman calmly gathering firewood in the moon. Don't be shocked. She's heating some soup for you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> old Mother Nature. So, then Robert, he, he, back in 1990, he kind of stopped it. And he said, when it comes to ritual thinking, the fourth type of thinking, that is so far out. You know, we, that, that's crazy. We don't get that yet. But he said the fourth one is called ritual thinking. And so, since Robert didn't get, get any further, and as I was trying to understand this better, of course, he's losing, you know, the ability to you know, explain to me what he's what it's about. Maybe some others that were closer to him did, but this is what I believe it is. Ritual thinking is like uh, a New Orleans burial ceremony, <laughs> where the whole community is carrying the casket to the graveyard and they're walking slow and they're they're saying their prayers or whatever their their chants and they're moving down slowly and the drum is beating but it's synchronized movement as they go to the cemetery then they put the corpse in the mausoleum. And then they start coming back. And now it's that second line beat. And it's fast. And they're moving and they're really dancing. And they're dancing all the way back to get the food. And there's different songs and different lyrics compared to when they were moving toward that. So the entire ceremony is about ritual thinking. Their bodies are thinking as they dance. Their emotions are thinking because they're dealing with grief and joy and sadness, all of that. They're in the concrete world. They're putting a coffin in a concrete mausoleum. You know? And there's all sorts of myths surrounding this, all sorts of metaphorical thinking going on. All four of those things are happening at the same time. And every once in a while, we do that in this group. I think there's a few people that may understand that's what we're doing. And I'm just saying, I think this is what we're doing. I think this is what we do in the winter time when we have our ritual out here and we light the fire and we're singing that song as we go down into the shrines and we pour whatever it is into that shrine mm -hmm. and then we come back and then we get back up here the song changes and we're dancing around in that circle in our own peculiar way. And a bear might come out of the woods, right? You know, I remember one time coming up, out there and dancing around, I look up and there's Orion, the constellation up there in the sky. That old hunter is looking down at us. We're doing ritual thinking. You know, that's what men's work is about for me. This is my personal experience. <coughs> you may have 
other ways to explain it. You may have other descriptions on the circle. You know, you may subdivide every quadrant into smaller and smaller sections and explanations. But the four directions are nodes. And all of this goes on. And you could use this pattern for almost anything that is living or dying, anything universal. The, the four types of uh, human existence, childhood, adulthood, elderhood, and ancestral. They line up on that circle in the same way. That's how I see it. Others have, uh, Wally Brown, the Navajo, has four ways of being, and they line up on the circle. A and so it's like, okay, this is the stuff that I am assuming my ancestral Irish uh, predecessors were doing in Ireland around their stone circle. And if they didn't do it, it works for me. You know? What I've done at home, I have a garden plot that is circular. I've put a different color stone in each of the directions. So every morning, now that I don't have to rush off to work at 7 o'clock in the morning. I take my cup of coffee and I walk the circle. Paying attention, oh, this is this, you know, remembering these things. Where did I get that? The first time when I had my, uh, my farm, Martin Preptel said, you know, one of the things that the old Irish kings used to do is every year they would they would do the gambit around their, their kingdom. So once a week I would do the gambit around my pasture and my house. Just to remind me and connect me with that land, with that place. Which took me back to when I was a, a, a tortured teenager and 20 year old going to the university trying to figure out things. What I, what I did then and I didn't know I was doing it, I didn't have this purpose, is before I'd go to school, I'd go and I'd, I'd walk around Como Lake, hmm. do the circle around Como Lake. And I did that for years because my body needed to, to discharge some of that anxiety and some of that stress before I went off to do work or school. In a circle, in a spiral. It was a circle. Mm -hmm. So, it's just what I've been thinking about, what I've been uh, working on, trying to put all this stuff together. This comes out of my background, my personal experience. When I was a little altar boy, nine years old, I became fascinated with the circularity of the ecclesiastical year mm -hmm. and how every different season had a different color for the vestments. Mm -hmm. And I didn't suffer the abuses others have. You know, I was, uh, I was blessed. And when I was a little 10 year old, 12 year old, whatever age I was, kneeling near the tabernacle, I could feel something. I don't want to discount that. I'm not going to let all those abusers ruin that, that memory, those memories for me. And then when I started thinking about uh, medicine circles and stone circles, uh, I went back to the cathedral in St. Paul. And I went and sat in the middle on it during the day and I looked up and in the four cardinal directions. You got the eagle, the bull, the lion, and the man. <laughs> the four evangelists, even the Catholic Church, has their 
their circle, and their dome. And it's there, and it's been misused by others who don't pay attention. And what, what's the, the poem? Is it the, by Rumi? Maybe it's Machado. I can't even remember the poem word. Yeah. The, the most important word from Je uh, by Jesus was awake. Wake up. All my words are one word. Wake up. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And so we're all waking up in different places. We're all at different age. We're all at different, uh, come from different places, but our bodies are waking up. We saw, we saw that happen in a few individuals here yesterday. Their bodies woke up in ways they hadn't awakened before. Our minds are awakening in different ways. You know, all my words are that. Wake up. Thanks, guys. Thank you.